The Columbia Pictures feature film of Dad's Army was made early in the show's career in 1970 and was premiered in March 1971. One of the locations for the film was Chelvon St Giles in Buckinghamshire. This pretty little town was transformed into Warmington-on-Sea, complete with some small boats and fishing nets, the Swallow Bank, Hodges' Greengrocer Shop and Jones' Butcher Shop, all of which had only been seen in interior studio mock-ups in the television series. Another location was Chobham in Surrey, where one hair-racing scene caused John Laurie to finish up with very badly bruised ribs. A white horse had to cross the river on a raft with our heroes on board. The raft was being towed downstream by way of ropes that were handled from the river bank, but the rather jerky movements of the tow lines unbalanced the horse and it slipped and fell, hitting John Laurie. It was not a pleasant thing to happen to anyone, let alone to someone in their 70s and an asthma sufferer as well. However, John recovered and luckily everyone else was unharmed. Other locations that were used for filming were Seaford in Sussex, various streets around Shepparton in Middlesex and the interior filming at Shepparton Studios. The film was produced by John Sloan and directed by Norman Cohen. It was not an easy assignment for the director or the actors. Columbia Pictures were determined to make the film on time. Eight weeks was their target, although it did take a little longer. Jimmy Perry and David Croft, the writers and advisers for the production, spent a great deal of time and energy trying to make sure that the film was kept in the 40s style. It was, of course, not so easy for an American film company to think of the era in the same way as we did. With the television series, David and Jimmy and all the crew knew the actors well, and they always ensured we were comfortable and happy and not being hurried into our work. But the feature film was a slightly different matter. The producer constantly put pressure on the director to get so many minutes in the can per day, and this in turn pressurised the production. Actors tend to find amusement in off-screen incidents, and one such occasion was when Arthur Lowe was given a rather heavy and cumbersome revolver to use, without ammunition because it didn't actually have to be fired. Arthur commented that as this was the case, could not the prop department find a plastic replica which would be easier to handle and quicker to get out of the holster he was wearing? The prop department said they didn't think they could, so Arthur decided to look for one himself. He ordered a unit car and, accompanied by one or two other actors, including Paul Dawkins, who was playing the German general, drove from the studios to the nearest Woolworth store. The sight of a large limousine pulling up outside Woolworths and Arthur plus the German general in full military uniform caused a few raised eyebrows among the passers-by. The Woolworths staff were even more surprised at being confronted by Captain Mannering and a German general asking for a plastic revolver. After all that, the store couldn't help, and Arthur, with his uniformed entourage, left the shop, muttering, you could always buy a sixpenny pistol in Woolworths when I was a lad. There were some very funny sequences in the feature film, although it didn't have the overall atmosphere of the television production. It was not an expensive film to produce, and all of the actors and production team associated with it have agreed that it has improved with age. The public certainly enjoys it because some of them have gone out of their way to say so each time it is shown on television. The official London premiere of the movie took place at the Columbia Cinema in London, and we all did some publicity appearances for it at various cinemas around the home counties, in 1970, it was just another sequence of events during the reign of Dad's army, but we all had to get back to work quickly in the television studios to make more episodes for the small screen. The stage musical of Dad's army was a major event in our lives in 1975 and 1976. We had heard about it some time before, but in no great detail. We were all asked whether we would be available and if we wanted to do it. Lord Delphond, who had already presented many large-scale musicals and pantomimes, was to combine with Triumph Theatre Productions in putting on the stage show. The television series was popular with the public, and they all thought it would be a good box office attraction. All the principals and regular supporting actors would be in the show, with the exception of John Laurie, who felt that working in the theatre every night and travelling between Buckinghamshire and London every day would be too tiring for him. A replacement also had to be found for Jimmy Beck, who had died two years before. There was no question that John or Jimmy could be replaced, but their characters had to be reproduced. It was not an easy task, particularly for the actors who would be playing the well-known parts of Fraser and Walker, as they needed to create personalities of their own, which is very important on stage. The two actors who were eventually cast in these difficult roles were John Barden as Walker and Hamish Roughhead as Fraser. It was while we were filming the television series that Jimmy Perry informed us what the show would be about. 
Jimmy is a very enthusiastic person at the best of times, but when he is in a dynamic mood, perhaps charged with a glass or two of red wine, is unstoppable. He asked Frank Williams, Ted Sinclair and myself to come up to his room at the Bell Hotel in Thetford, where he could explain the details. Once Jimmy had started, he gave us a solo performance of the proposed show. He dashed about his bedroom, leapt on the bed, rushed to the door and went in and out of the bathroom, depicting various scenes, demonstrating various acts, playing all the characters and singing all the songs, until he finally sat down on his bed and said, Well, how does that sound? Ted Sinclair, who had sat motionless through it all, said, I'm tied out and the show hasn't even started yet. Rehearsals for the show were held at the Richmond Theatre, the lovely Victorian Playhouse in Surrey. The director was a young man called Roger Redfarn, who had, among other things, been artistic director at the successful Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. David Croft and Jimmy Perry were obviously going to be very much in evidence, advising, suggesting and keeping a close eye on the production. The musical director, who was in charge of a large orchestra, was an American Ed Coleman. Ed proved to be a tremendous help to us as rehearsals got underway and afterwards during the actual production. For Ed cajoled, shouted, encouraged and complimented the cast all in the space of a few minutes. On the first day of rehearsal, he got the whole company together and made us sing collectively and solo the first two bars of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. His experience was such that he could judge our singing range with that short burst of song. The choreographer was Sheila O'Neill, who had the task of teaching people of all shapes and sizes, some with two left feet like me, and several of them new to a full stage musical, but each and every one of us very enthusiastic. Also in the cast was Joan Cooper, Arthur Lowe's wife, who was to play Private Godfrey's sister Dolly, as she had done on numerous occasions in the television series. Eric Longworth, who had played the town clerk in several episodes, Michael Beavis, Norman MacLeod and Geoffrey Holland, who would be playing a mad German inventor as well as being part of the general production team. After three weeks' rehearsal at Richmond, we made our way north to Billingham in Cleveland for the out-of-town opening of the show. We were due to run it at the Forum Theatre there before moving into the Shaftesbury Theatre in London in the autumn. When we first arrived at the Forum, the stage doorkeeper was obviously confused about our names, for when John Le Major arrived, he greeted him with the words, Good morning, sir. Are you on all though? The extensive workshops of the Forum had made all the sets, most of which were quite complicated, and extra staff had to be drafted in to handle them. They were designed to represent the two sides of the English Channel, and consisted of two electrically controlled trucks that moved onto the stage from the wings. Corporal Jones was on top of one truck guarding the British coast, while the German general, played by myself, and the mad inventor sat on top of the opposite truck, looking out from France. In another scene, Private Godfrey would glide on stage on a truck that represented his cottage garden, talking to his sister Dolly about the current cricket scores, which to him were more important than anything else. On a different truck, Field Marshal Goering would be extolling the virtues of the Luftwaffe and how they were going to blast the British out of the skies. The scene finished with Godfrey reciting Lords of the Air and the boys and girls forming a choir in the background. This was a very moving moment in the show, and it was played superbly by Alma Ridley and Joan Cooper. During the technical rehearsal, there were moments of anxiety over whether certain equipment was going to work or a scene that had been envisaged on paper would prove successful in practice. One such scene was the banana production. Ian, Pike, was to be zipped up in a huge plastic banana and dash about asking people when he could have the elusive banana, not seen in this country during World War II. It was rehearsed and re-rehearsed many times. We would get to the theatre in the morning only to be told that for the next couple of hours only the banana people were required. The problems with the song were finally sorted out and it proved to be a big success in the show, much to Ian Lavender's relief because he had been in and out of that plastic banana skin many times over. There was a very complicated production number called Too Late, about the killing of General Gordon at Khartoum, which featured Clive Dunn recalling Corporal Jones' experiences as a young soldier. John Le Measure had a scene with Private Pike and his mother, which led into a nightingale sang in Barclay Square, sung by John. This was given all the experience of John's theatrical technique, and proved to be one of those quiet but delightful moments that you occasionally experience in the theatre. Several of us were involved in a scene that concerned radio personalities of the 40s. Arthur Lowe did a very passable impersonation of Rob Wilton, with all the comic mannerisms of that great humorist. Pamela Candell and Joan Cooper appeared as Elsie and Doris Waters, Gert and Daisy. Three of the girls combined in a very good presentation of the American favourites, the Andrews sisters, and Arthur also played Mr Lovejoy with Michael Beavis as Ramsbottom and Ian Lavender as Enoch from We Three in Happy Drome, a huge radio success during the war. 
I was given the opportunity to portray the cheeky chappy Max Miller. I was slightly worried about performing this at Billingham, because although Miller had been a great bill-topper in his heyday, in variety at the London Palladium and elsewhere, he had never performed in the most northern areas of the country. I had actually worked with Max Miller when I was playing in variety in the 1950s, so I had some idea of his style, and this helped considerably. To complete the entertainment scene of the 1940s, Arthur Lowe and John the Measurer appeared as Flanagan and Allen, those great stars of the crazy gang. The song Hometown started with Arthur and John walking across the stage. When they got to the other side, they picked up two more members of the cast who were dressed the same way. They then walked back in and picked up two more members from the other side, and so it went on with the whole cast eventually arriving on stage with those in the back rows carrying life-size cutouts of Flanagan and Allen and all singing Hometown. It was a tremendously effective scene. The only two members of the cast who were not involved in Hometown were myself and Geoffrey Holland. We followed high upon our truck, commenting on the uncertainties of our future, now that it looked as if the Allies were going to win the war. One of the most enjoyable pieces to perform was the Morris Dance, which involved a disciplined routine that went haywire when it was performed by Mannering's boys, together with the warden who started arguing with Jones and brandishing his club, causing chaos until Mannering restored order. The white costumes, Panama hats, bells and colourful tassels looked most attractive. Another favourite piece was the floral dance, a comedy routine which also involved the whole cast and was supposed to be a rehearsal for the Home Guard and citizens of Warmington of a choir concert they were going to give in aid of wounded soldiers. It not only included some wonderful visual comedy, but also very funny dialogue. Both the Morris dance and the choir practice had been adapted for the stage from the television episodes, so we had a certain amount of confidence in performing them. The opening night suddenly arrived, and we just hoped that the pack theatre would receive the show well. We need not have worried, for apart from one or two minor technical hitches and overrunning a little, most people enjoyed it. The rest of our short stay at Billingham went well, with crowds coming in from all over the northeast to see us. Once back in London, we were to open our West End run at the Shaftesbury Theatre. Some cuts had to be made during the two or three days' rehearsal at the Shaftesbury, as we were still overrunning. We had a few days of previews at the Shaftesbury, and then came the official opening night. The atmosphere was electric, and a packed house that included some friends and relations, and it seemed we would stay at the London venue for a while yet. Very early into the run, we were all asked to stay on stage after the show. We were then informed that we had been invited to take part in the annual Royal Variety performance at the London Palladium, in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. This was exciting news, and it was decided that we should perform the floral dance choir item, as this was not only a good comedy piece, which was going well at the Shaftesbury, but it also included the whole cast. There was to be a tremendous amount of security around the Palladium for the Royal Show, because there had been one or two bomb scares in London during the autumn of 1975. On a couple of occasions, it had affected our show. The audience was asked to leave halfway through a performance, and we also had to go. It was amusing to see Arthur Lowe in Mannering Star saying, Right, follow him in. And off we would march up the road to the pub, where we'd have a drink before we were told that it was a false alarm, and then we'd return to the theatre to continue the show. When the weekend arrived for the Royal Performance, we used the Shaftesbury Theatre as our base, and were shuttled backwards and forwards to the Palladium by coach for rehearsal. On Sunday and Monday, the day of the show, we were driven back and forth along Oxford Street with packs of sandwiches and flasks of coffee. We were continually being searched and given identity papers. The finale of the Royal Variety performance must be as well rehearsed as any other item to ensure that the entire cast can fit on the stage. There was Count Basie and his band, the Ross Male Voice Choir, Choir Zulu Dancers, the Billy Lyre Company from Drury Lane Theatre, Telly Savalas, Kojak and his cabaret company, the cast of Dan's Army, plus all the other principals, Bruce Forsyth, Vera Lynn, Charles Asnavour, Jukes and Lee, Harry Seacom and the huge orchestra. After we'd finished the final rehearsal on Monday, we were all dispersed to different buildings around the Palladium, because there's only limited dressing room accommodation there, and with over 350 people taking part in the show, we could not all be fitted in. We were called over to the Palladium from our hiding place nearby, just before the royal family arrived. We were on stage early in the show, so had a long wait until the final curtain. We certainly saw the Duke of Edinburgh laughing at our performance, and it was an exciting moment to stand on the stage of the great theatre in front of the huge audience and in the presence of the royal couple. After the show, the entire cast were lined up and introduced to Her Majesty and His Royal Highness. A moment in the evening that made me laugh was when we were waiting in the wings for the finale line-up. I was standing next to Arthur Lowe, and next to him were members of the Kwazulu African dancers. 
Arthur and I were suddenly conscious that something was happening next to him. We looked around and saw one of the dancers next to Arthur breastfeeding a baby. The baby and his mother's breast were level with Arthur's eye line. Arthur did one of his double takes and then said to the lady, He enjoys a drink, does he? Another pause. I could do with one right now. Another happy occasion while we were at the Shaftesbury was the celebration of Arnold Ridley's 80th birthday. This was performed on stage with a huge cake and the national press in attendance. It was remarkable to think that this dear man of 80 was still playing nightly, plus two matinees a week in the theatre. By February 1976, we were told that we would be finishing at the Shaftesbury and would be making a long tour around the country. A few items would have to be changed and the scenery altered because at times we would be playing some much smaller theatres. The orchestra was also to be reduced, but we were still going to have our wonderful musical director, Ed Coleman, with us. Clive Dunn was only doing half the tour as he had prior commitments, so Jack Haig was to play Corporal Jones when Clive left. We opened the tour at the Opera House Manchester, and then on to Blackpool, and then, in that beautiful weather of 1976, to Newcastle, Bournemouth, Birmingham and Nottingham, where we were able to get in some cricket practice. A match had been arranged for us to play when we arrived in Bradford, so we thought we should loosen up a bit first. At Nottingham, we practised the famous Trent Bridge Cricket Ground, the headquarters of Nottinghamshire CC. A few of us, including 80-year-old Arnold Ridley, had a gentle practice in the outdoor nets, and then went into the indoor cricket school. At one point, Ian Lavender was bowling to me and hit me fair and square on my big toe. Brian Clough, the Nottingham Forest football manager, was also having some net practice, and he drove me straight over to the football ground across the road and called the doctor to drill my toe, which had already turned black. The drill did the trick, and I had no after-effects. While we were in Nottingham, we were invited to a very peculiar film party after the show one night. All those invited went with the exception of Arthur Lowe, and I reckon he must have known something. The party was in a fairly small, semi-detached house, and a couple of cars had been laid on to take us there. We were shown into a lounge which had a bar and a huge ham and organ, which went right up into the ceiling above. Cheese and ham rolls were handed around by the host and his wife, and then their two small daughters came in and proceeded to play the enormous ham and organ. The whole house, and probably the adjoining house next door too, shook like crazy with the vibrations, and when it finished, the little girls took a bow and went to bed. The host then asked if we would like to see some funny films. Arnold Ridley, who had been having a doze in spite of the noise of the organ, said, Oh, how nice. We like comedy films, thinking of a vintage Harold Lloyd or Laurel and Hardy. It took us a few seconds to understand that the films were not to be funny ha-ha, but funny very peculiar. So we beat a hasty retreat out of the house and back to our hotels. After an enjoyable stay in Brighton, where my wife and I used to live, it was off to the Bradford Alhambra and our famous cricket match. Arthur Lowe was president of the Hayfield Cricket Club in Derbyshire, as his father had been before him. The club wanted to build a new pavilion, and the cast of Dad's Army agreed to play Hayfield to raise the money to make this possible. The idea was to make a weekend of it, staying in various pubs in Hayfield overnight. Luckily, it was a lovely sunny Sunday when we set off by coach from Bradford. When we arrived, the little village was seething with people who had literally turned out in their thousands to see their television idols, as one gentleman put it. We all had our good lunch, accompanied by plenty of the local brew. As Arthur said, By gum, we stopped a few barrels going sour today. He inspected his side before the match in military fashion, and the game got underway. Every stroke played by the Dad's Army team drew applause from the huge crowd, and a catch made by them was almost more than the onlookers could bear. Small boys jumped for joy, and the beer tent was near to collapse as yet more beers were consumed. I was batting and had made two or three when Arnold Ridley came in and it was decided that he should have a runner. Arnold played one or two fine strokes and then became rather excited. He hit a full toss into the outfield and started to run, together with his runner and myself. We all finished up in a heap at one end and it was deemed that I was out. At the end of the match, enough money had been collected from the sale of programmes and raffles to make it possible for work to start immediately on the new pavilion and Arthur officially opened it a year or two later. We stopped a few more barrels going south in the evening before starting off for the return journey back to Bradford. Arthur was in one of his skittish moods and when the coach stopped to allow the gentlemen in the party to relieve themselves on the side of the road, hidden by the coach, Arthur quietly told the coach driver to move on. The sight of a dozen males standing in a straight line hastily adjusting their dress was like something out of a French farce. We played the Richmond Theatre, 
where it had all started with those early rehearsals, and this allowed most of us to live at home that week. It also coincided with my 50th birthday, and as a special surprise, the company had a huge cake made in the shape of my white warden's helmet. It was here at Richmond that just before the finale of the midweek matinee, Geoffrey Holland received news that his wife had gone into labour in hospital in Coventry. Geoffrey asked his understudy to take over for the evening show, and by a miracle of good rail connections, was in Coventry in two hours. The result was a lovely baby boy, and although Arthur Lowe, quite naturally, and with reason, scolded Jeff on his return to the show next day for unprofessional conduct in the theatre, the first bouquet of flowers to arrive at the hospital for Jeff's wife, Ellie, was from Arthur and Joan Lowe, with love. The last date of the tour was at Bath, and it was a most memorable finale to the six months we had been on the road after leaving the Shaftesbury Theatre in London. During the first week in Bath, the Duke of Beaufort brought in a party to see the show one night and asked us to have drinks with him afterwards. Among his party was Neville Chamberlain's daughter-in-law, who invited us to have lunch with her, and it turned out to be a fascinating day. Among her guests was General Roosevelt, the late American president's son. We were shown all the mementos of her father-in-law, his gifts from King George VI, who was a close friend, and the letters he sent to his son during the Munich crisis in 1938. To see those actual handwritten letters concerning a period I remember so vividly as a youngster was an extraordinary experience. So a year with the stage show came to an end. However, we still had another television series to make before we finally said farewell to Dan's army. Recording the radio version of Dad's Army was never going to be easy, but it was a very enjoyable experience, and the end result was received with a great deal of pleasure by the listening public. On several occasions, the recordings were done on our day off from the television studios, and there was one spell of about a fortnight when we did two recordings a day. At first, they were recorded in the old Playhouse Theatre, and later in the BBC Paris studios in Lower Regent Street. The BBC commissioned Harold Snow to Michael Knowles to adapt the series for radio, and they went on to adapt some 70 episodes. Both were well known to Dad's Army. Harold had begun as a production assistant with the television series, and Michael had acted in several episodes of the programme. They both understood the characters and the actors playing them well enough to make their job a little easier than it would normally have been. It required a lot of work to translate the visual element of Dad's Army into purely sound terms. Characters were supposed to ascend in balloons, risk death from unexploded bombs and runaway giant wheels spitting fire, commandeer trains and negotiate raging rivers, all while defending their country against the ever-present threat of Nazi invasion. Fortunately, after removing the visual gags from an original Dad's Army script, there remained enough good dialogue to create good radio comedy. But one or two episodes had to be completely rewritten because adaptation was just not possible and not every member of the cast was used in each programme, simply because there would not have been enough for everyone to do in a particular episode. It was no problem for the cast to recreate their television roles for radio, but it took a little time to learn the different technique of having to use the static microphone in a certain way to create distance and atmosphere, interspersed with all the various sound effects which had to be allowed for. Once they'd mastered this, though, the cast had great fun. The producer, John Dias, was terribly enthusiastic about the project and sometimes got a little carried away by his enthusiasm. For example, one episode had the platoon adrift in an open boat. In an attempt to simulate sitting in a rowing boat on radio, John had arranged all the actors' chairs in the rough shape of a boat on the stage of the Paris studio. This was fine in theory, but it had one drawback. The microphones, which were fixed, were all on the port side of the boat, as it were. This meant the actors sitting on the starboard side couldn't be heard, or had to scramble over the person next to him in order to reach the microphones. This resulted in some chaos as the actors got tangled up with one another, even in one or two cases finished up on the floor muttering mild oaths. It was then decided to go back to the more conventional broadcasting methods. Another episode called for Clive Dunn, Corporal Jones, to cycle through the streets of Warmington-on-Sea. John Dias decided it would be a good idea if Clive actually rode a bicycle on stage. Well, Clive's enthusiastic response to this was immediate. I should like to bunk to ride a bicycle around the stage, sir. With that, he leapt astride the bike and attempted several circuits of the stage before the idea was abandoned as being not only too dangerous for the cast, but also for the audience. As it turned out, it worked better when Clive just walked swiftly between two microphones. Such is the magic of radio. Although rumours were flying around in the summer of 1977 that we might be recording the last series of Dad's Army, I don't think it made any great impression on the actors, as we had heard the possibility before. 
However, when we had the final scripts in our possession, which were all very funny with some intriguing situations, the last episode did have a certain suggestion about it, that the end might be in sight. We thought that if it was the end of the series, at least we would go out on a high note and not outstay our welcome with the public, who had shown so much affection for us, even including the baddie Air Raid Warden Hodges. In the entertainment business, actors are always moving to pastures new and are used to change, and it has to be remembered that Dad's army had lasted for nine years. The writers, Jimmy and David, had done a marathon job in creating 80 episodes altogether, as well as the feature film and stage show. We had enjoyed the pre-filming of the last series at Thetford, the last episode of which, never too old, showed our gallant lads drinking a toast to the Home Guard and mannering declaring that men will always stand together whenever Britain needs them. The episode also included the marriage of Corporal Jones to Mrs Fox, who incidentally was given away by Captain Mannering, so Jones had finally beaten his rivals for his sweetheart's hand. A nice touch by David and Jimmy was to include the wives and girlfriends, those with equity membership of the cast, to play the wedding guests. It was, in fact, the last ever episode of Dad's Army, and it had finished without fuss and with no dramatic ending, as generally happens in television series and soap operas nowadays. The series ended quietly, just as it had started in 1968. We had become a working family, and as all families, we enjoyed the social life connected with the series. We often had parties in our various homes and on Arthur Lowe's boat during the rehearsal and recording weeks in London. Arthur also arranged a marvellous day for us on a floating restaurant on the Regent's Canal. One memorable trip was when we went to Blackpool to switch on the illuminations. We assembled with our wives at Euston Station and were greeted by a gold-braided station master who showed us to our dining car. On arrival in Blackpool, we were given a civic welcome by the mayor, and after various media interviews, we changed into our uniforms, ready to throw the switch that would illuminate the famous Golden Mile. It was now pouring with rain, but the job was done very cheerily, with a little assistance from a wee dram or two. We then boarded the open-top tram to make our journey, as is customary on these occasions, along the mile. In spite of the rain, the public turned out in great numbers to cheer us on our way. The evening finished with a dinner in the company of the civic dignitaries, it had all been quite an experience. A night to remember was when we received the BAFTA Award for the Best Situation Comedy Programme. Not only did we receive the prize from Princess Anne, but we wined and dined at London's Royal Albert Hall in the company of some of the great entertainers of our business. Sitting on the table next to us was someone we all admired, the American film star Ray Milland, there to present one of the awards. We had to wait in a tunnel, one of the many that lead up onto the stage, and when we were called, it was a memorable experience to walk on stage to the programme's signature tune, Who do you think you are kidding, Mr Hitler, if you think we're on the run, etc., and to face the hundreds of people from our profession, and then to be introduced by Richard Attenborough to the Princess. As we walked off, the thunderous applause which greeted our presentation was still ringing in our ears. When the series did finally finish, I think it slipped the minds of the BBC hierarchy to give us the sort of send-off that would have been appreciated at that time. But the Daily Mirror stepped in after their television critic announced the news in his column. The Mirror invited us and our wives, plus a few friends, to a sumptuous dinner at London's Café Royal, and they presented us with medals which were inscribed for services to television entertainment. Speeches were made, some slightly ribald in content, and a good time was had by all. There was, however, more to come. Later we did get an invitation from the BBC Board of Governors, no less, to have lunch with them, and compliments about the series were sincerely given and gratefully received. At the end of the nine years, we had been blessed with two writers and a host of backroom boys and girls whom we will always remember with great affection. During the rehearsals of the Dad's Army stage show in 1975, I had the pleasure to be able to record a new version of a very old song called Get Out and Get Under the Moon. And I did this with one of the chaps who was in the Dad's Army stage show called Norman MacLeod. When you're all alone, any old night, and you're feeling out of tune, pick up your hat, close up your flat, get out and get under the moon. Underneath the bright silvery light, you'll be feeling better soon. Pick up your hats, close up your flats, get out and get under the moon. Oi! Oi, you over there! Put that light! 
Shut out! I shan't tell you again! I've got no respect for the law. This is a nice song. It is. The last time I sang this song, they came flying over in their hundreds. What, the cherries? No, pigeons. Where was that? Huddersfield. Got a lot of statues in Huddersfield. Oh? Same thing happened in Clacton. Were they the same pigeons? I don't know. Mr Hodges, you know, you've got a quiet sort of voice. Well, I'm a quiet sort of person. You have to be if you're a chief air raid warden. Hoy, oh, put that light out! Hooligans! Here. I think I could hear them coming over again. What, the pigeons? No, the jerrys. Oh, they won't be over tonight, mate. It's too bright. Look, look, look at the stars above. Look, look, look at the sweetest love. Lummy, that sounded near. Here. Yeah. I hope it wasn't the church hall. So do I. I've just had the piano tune. Well, hadn't you better go and investigate? I, maybe it might have started a fire or something. Oh, don't worry. If it has, they'll keep it going till we get there. Oh. How's the wife's chill, Blaze? They're not bad at all.